This is the first lecture uh, on Chapter F, and it's a lecture on the version of Chapter F which I myself wrote, not the version which is in Miguel Roy Francoli's book. So this is based on the uh, TypeScript version of Chapter F, which I handed out in class. Okay, I'm going to share my screen with you. Chapter F begins to deal with counterpoint, with the art of combining independent lines of music to make an aesthetically pleasing musical texture. As we learned in Chapter E, when we learned about texture, music that is made up of two or more different melodic lines, or two or more different voices or parts, is known as polyphony. The term counterpoint refers both to the art of combining two or more melodic lines and to the set of technical principles that regulate such combination of voices. And it's to these technical principles that we'll be turning in chapter F. All music in which different independent voices are presented together is contrapuntal music or is counterpoint. For most of this semester and for next semester, we will be focused on writing four part counterpoint that is chordal music that is conceived for a choir consisting of soprano, alto, tenor, and bass voices. In that choir, the outer voices, the soprano and the bass parts, are the most important, with the inner voices, the alto and the tenor, being less important and serving mostly to complete the chords. Sorry to tell you that, altos and tenors, but you do have a, a less significant role. Uh, I sing alto in the choir, and I really enjoy hearing those inner parts and hearing what the guts of the counterpoint are doing. So in this chapter, we're going to learn how to write a good soprano line and also how to write a good bass line. And then we'll talk about how to compose the two together so that they make good counterpoint. Once we've mastered the art of writing a soprano line with a bass line, then we'll be ready to write the four part counterpoint that we'll be doing for the rest of the semester. Okay, here's an example of a chordal composition uh, for a four-part choir written by J.S. Bach. You can see in this music that um, there are four independent lines. The soprano line and the alto line are written in, in treble clef, and the tenor and the bass line are written in bass clef. And the entire four-part example sounds like this. an approximation of the sound by playing just the soprano and the bass line. So let's listen just to the soprano and the bass line together. So we'll be learning to write a soprano line by itself, a bass line by itself, and then to write the two together so that they make a good framework for counterpoint. Just a couple of comments about this example. Notice that the soprano line is very conjunct. It consists almost entirely of repeated notes and stepwise motion. There's a small leap in the soprano line going from the first complete measure to the second complete measure, leaping from B to G natural. Then there's a bigger leap going from the E at the end of the first phrase to the B that starts the next phrase. And that leap in a sense doesn't count because it's not within a phrase. So the, the top line is very conjunct and quite easily singable. This, uh, this line is pretty much like the lines that you'll be writing. I think the uh, guidelines that I give you say that you should only repeat a note three times, and Bach does it four times. Also, Bach goes outside of the scale with notes like D sharp and G natural, and you're supposed to stay within the scale. But otherwise, this is a pretty good model. Now let's turn our attention to the bass line. You can see that the bass line is more disjunct. It has leaps of a fourth, 
leaps of a fifth. It even has a couple of leaps of an octave. But the bass line is still logical, and it's still basically singable because the leaps are within important scale degrees that is going from a significant scale degree to another significant scale degree so that uh, our ear can kind of pick up on the leap. Here's the bass line by itself. And you can hear that each of the phrases ends on a five chord. In the beginning, we're going to confine our phrases to ending on a one chord or on a five chord. And later we'll learn the names for these arrivals on five and one. Because one of the functions of counterpoint is to preserve the independence and the quality of individual lines, we will first practice writing single lines, especially single soprano lines. Bass lines are harder to write because they need to follow harmonic as well as melodic rules. So here are the guidelines to follow when writing a soprano melody. And all of this information is contained within the chapter that I wrote. First of all, melodies are either in a major key or they use a melodic minor scale. So if you're in a minor key, you should use the scale degrees te and le when the line is descending and scale degrees la and t when the line is ascending. Apart from the major scale and the melodic minor scale, um, other notes would not appear. So don't go outside of the key signature unless you're in a minor key and you're using la and t. Also, because we're really focusing in on the pitch element right now, our melodies are going to consist only of quarter notes. The only exception to that is that the last note, which has to be on a strong beat, can be a half note or a quarter note. When we say that the last note of the melody must be on a strong beat, we mean that it needs to be on the downbeat or it needs to be on beat one or beat three of a quadruple meter. Okay, melodies are going to start on a note of the tonic triad, that is the tonic, median, or dominant note, except in rare cases. Melodies are going to have a range of not much more than an octave and often considerably less than an octave. Number four, melodies are going to have a clear shape. They will be an arch that goes up and then down, or an inverted arch that goes down and then up. They'll have an overall descent or an overall ascent. Um, of course, it would be boring if the melody was just a scale. So even when we have an overall descent, we'll sometimes move the line up only to continue going down. Uh, the same thing for a line with an overall ascent. In our melodic line, there is a single high point, which is called the, the zenith of the line, and there is a single low point, which is called the nadir of the line. Melodies are mostly conjunct. They consist of repeated notes, although for the time being there should be no more than three repeated notes in a row, also steps and thirds. A melodic phrase can employ one or rarely two larger leaps of a perfect fourth, a perfect fifth, a sixth, or a perfect octave. Leaps of a seventh are prohibited, and also leaps of an augmented fourth or diminished fifth are not allowed. For that matter, no augmented or diminished intervals are allowed in the soprano line. Seven, two leaps in a row in the same direction can occur as long as the notes outline a major or a minor triad. So we can have a major third followed by a minor third. We could have a minor third followed by a major third. We could have a third followed by a perfect fourth, or we could have a perfect fourth followed by a third. Note that these restrictions are just for two leaps in the same direction. If we have a leap up followed by a leap down, we can use a lot more different combinations of intervals. We could have a leap up of a fifth, followed by a leap down of a third. We could have a leap up of a fourth, followed by a leap down of a fifth, and so on. But two leaps in a row in the same direction need to make a major or a minor triad. When we have two sm small leaps in a row in the same direction, or when there is a larger leap, a perfect fifth or larger, it should be followed most of the time by motion in the opposite direction. 
So this is kind of a soft rule. You could disobey this rule occasionally, but in general, it's good to compensate for a large leap by motion in the opposite direction. Number nine, your melody should end on an appropriate melodic cadence and on a strong beat. And I've already defined what a strong beat is. The melodic cadence, that is the arrival point for the melody, will either be on a tonic chord, and in that case, the melody should end on a scale degree one or scale degree three approached by step. We can have T going to Do, Re going to Do, Re going to Mi, or if we're in minor, Re going to Me. But for now, we will not have Fa going to Mi or Fa going to Me. Or if the phrase ends on a five chord, the melody should end on scale degree two or scale degree five, and it should be approached either by step or from the same note. And finally, you should be able to sing your melody easily. If your melody is too difficult or too weird to sing, then you should go back and edit it to make it easier or to make it more normal. That concludes with uh, the guidelines for writing a soprano melody. In class, we'll be looking at individual melodies to see how well they follow the guidelines and to find errors, and we'll also try writing our own soprano melodies. The next lecture will take up the somewhat similar guidelines for writing a bass melody.